But today, when we are in rather um, a rather unusual situation, uh, particularly in the aftermath of the uh, Gaza campaign, um, maybe narrative is the word we have to look at. You know, today, um, in many uh, capitals of the Arab world, there are leaders in the Sunni camp who are saying, why didn't Israel finish the job? And yet, um, while we have that kind of implicit support uh, among some of our neighbors, albeit under the table, um, we have European countries where large audiences are condemning us for the Gaza campaign, and assuming that we are engaged in war crimes. In fact, this new idea, which the Jerusalem Center has been dealing with, of uh, trying, of supporting uh, charges against Israeli officers for war crimes, uh, charges based on the work of Palestinian NGOs who manipulate European law, this is becoming more widespread. And it's not just Belgium, it's not just England, it's now more recently pronounced in Spain. So in that world, the question we have to ask ourselves is, why is this occurring? Our normal response that we engage in here, of course, at the Jerusalem Center, at the Shalem Center, of course, where uh, Natan Sharansky runs the Adelson Center, we're oftentimes dealing with the micro issues. Well, you know, actually at the UNRWA school, there was a uh, Palestinian artillery position there, so it was counter-battery fire, we weren't sure to get a school. You know, we're always dealing with the, many times, I shouldn't speak for the Shalem Center, but I'm just saying, as far as what we often do in our material, is we're explaining these micro pictures. And in fact, it may be that there's a bigger drama at play here. And it sort of doesn't matter what the argument is, although Dover itself should get it out in a timely way. Um, there may be something about predisposition, about how people see Israel in their world view. Uh, prior to 1967, it has nothing to do with the territories, but prior to 1967 when um, you know, socialist Israel was aligned with socialist parties in Europe and uh, the kibbutz was kind of the socialist dreamland, uh, people came from Europe and there was a kind of narrative about Israel which they were very comfortable with. And uh, today when Israel's on the front line of a war against radical Islam and they themselves are uncertain about the merits of that war in Europe, then um, the narrative has changed and what Israel is exactly doing isn't understood and reaching out to fundamental aspects of European attitudes becomes all the more important. And I think this is why I uh, especially commend Kalman uh, Nierenstein's book because it really addresses that issue and something we have not done sufficiently and she does <coughs> magnificently. So uh, before we get to uh, Fiamma's words, I'd like to uh, introduce our uh, two other guests tonight, to this, this morning, who's going to be speaking. Of course, Natan Sharansky, who uh, chairs the Edison Institute for Strategic Studies at the Shalem Center, and has a, a long history of being probably one of the most prominent uh, Zionist fighters for the Jewish people today. And of course, uh, Ruthie Bloom, Leibowitz, who's features editor and columnist in the Jerusalem Post. And if you haven't read her uh, recent interview with John Bolton, you should. It's one of many which uh, is rich in content and insight. So let me turn the floor over to Nathan Sharansky. Dear friends, good morning. It's so nice to be in the friendly, friendly territory of this institute, uh, but uh, it's in one eyes that we are okay, reintroducing the book of the wonderful, wonderful book of the wonderful person, or outstanding journalist, writer, politician, and most important fighter for the dignity of her people in the world country. Uh, Israel today is enrolled in three big wars. In, in fact, in three wars we have universal dimensions. One war is the war between the world of freedom and the world of fear. And what to do 
uh, if you look at the map of the world, if you put on it the map of free, Freedom House, which estimate gives its uh, marks, its grades to every country every year, you'll see that there is only one big black spot on this map, and that's Middle East. And there is no comparison from the point of this criteria of uh, Freedom House, which have nothing to do with Zionism, with uh, Jews, with, uh, with anything. It's also only abstract parameters of civil and political freedoms. There is one, by far the most black part in the world, and that's Middle East. And this Middle East is a very, very small, tiny island, which you can't even read it, put its name on the map, if the map is not big enough, and that's Israel. So it's natural that when there is such a beachhead of free world, small, small island inside the uh, bordering with totalitarian regimes, these totalitarian regimes are fighting its real danger, its real threat to all these regimes, and they are fighting and fight even after they sign uh, peace agreements, they'll do everything to, to weaken our position in the world because we are danger to them, and we are danger to them in terms of their relations with their own people. So that's one struggle which Israel has through all its history, and correctly so it feels itself as a representative of the free world. Because after all, all the free world wants that there will be more freedom all over and the dictators will be weak. The second struggle is between fundamentalism and I would say rationalism, including all types of rational, some, some of the democratic, some of the dictators, but all those who want to build their life in this world against those for whom the aim is to uh, build their way to the next world. And uh, the best way to guarantee it is to, to destroy as many infidels or to take, uh, as possible. And what to do if you look at the Muslim world, the only, uh, in the Middle East, the only entity which is not run by Muslims, the only territory which politically is not controlled by Muslims is Israel. And it's natural that it, uh, it, it creates not only uh, desires, simply uh, passion to believe that the, the first obligation of these regimes is to destroy Israel. And again here, <coughs> just at the time when all the world, all the free world, uh, faces this problem of rising fundamentalist terror, of course, it's natural that Israel sees itself, and many the world see that that's, they are those who are on the front line. The problem is that there is the third war, and maybe the most difficult war that Israel has. That's the war inside free world, that Israel has to fight for its right to exist as a national, as a Jewish democratic state, at the time when the free world doesn't believe in national. United States, doesn't believe in nationalism, doesn't believe in identity, believe that the best way to guarantee universal peace and freedom is to love everybody, to almost like Dori Lehab says that he doesn't like narratives, because <laughs> that the world doesn't need narrative. There is one universal truth for everybody. So that's why narrative is a good word. <laughs> uh, and so just at that moment, when it is clear for many political leaders and for leading intellectuals that it is so easy to reach the world of freedom and justice, simply by having one narrative for everybody, giving away all these nationals, national states, it's, uh, it belongs to the past exactly as a colonial past. And here Israel, which is fighting for the values of the free world, can defend these values only by insisting on its, uh, its right to be Jewish state. And that's the problem, that's the dilemma. And here comes book of Yama, which deals with this problem, and which reminds the world, which tries to put this world in front of the mirror and to remind them that if there is hope for them, that's in Israel. And they have, not only they have to learn from it, they have to do the best to support Israel as a Jewish democratic state. 
So if only Yama would remind the world our narrative, and she spends a lot of pages on reminding our narrative. Diana, because the seller which brings to all those West European countries our narrative these days, it's, it's very diff difficult to be heard even. So Diana. But Fiamma does more than this. She uh, explains why identity is so important for Israel and for the world. Why universal values cannot be defended simply in the abstract, in the vacuum. So I will also say, if it's only this day, but she does something even more impressive, which I didn't see in other books. In the story. She takes her own life, she shows it very frankly and openly, how she was a leftist, uh, I don't know how far she went into her uh, left views, whether she reached Trotskyism or stopped before it, uh, liberalism of those days, uh, but, uh, but she lived in, in, in the community of people who go all, loved all the gold, go universalists, knew that all these capitalists and uh, all the other class enemies are trying to build uh, walls between the people and they are destroying it, and how this life there becomes empty, becomes without any feelings, without any love, without any sympathy to one another, how you are losing the interest in life itself. And that's exactly what was so powerful that she openly showing her own uh, way to, to the uh, to, uh, Jewish girl going after universal love and universal values and coming back to national pride. She shows that that is the way of Israel and that should be the way of, of the, the free world. That otherwise, it is decadence, it's powerlessness, it's self-destruction, and of course there is no chance to defend your freedom against our enemies. So in addition to all this, I can say that Gamma is not only wrote a very important book, but she proved herself that one person can make a big change, being a passionate journalist for many years, and then probably being so desperate of the helplessness of all the politicians around, she decided herself to be a politician, and she's proving that even one strong politician can make big difference when everybody who saw these pictures of uh, the central square in front of the Italian parliament filled with Israeli flags and demonstrators in support of uh, Israel could be fr proud for Israel and for Fiamma. Thank you. I've known Fiamma for quite a few years now, and I think I met her at what was the height of the suicide bombing war. Um, I never had, until that moment, met somebody busier than myself. Um, Fiamma would, in the morning, be rushing to the Lebanon border, in the evening to the Gazan border, in the middle, reading the Jerusalem Post, the New York Times, the Italian papers, the Hebrew papers, and cooking lasagna for 20 people. <laughs> she would, she put up the fight for Israel on a daily basis, both physically and spiritually and emotionally. I mean, she was schlepping around this country and twice a month would go back to Italy to her newspaper and come back. That's no small feat. So she was also jet-lagged while doing all of this. But never did I ever see her uh, act as though she were war-weary, um, other than when she came back from Europe. She would say, you know, Ruthie, you just don't know what it's like there. It's the only time I ever saw any maybe slight tiredness in her voice. Uh, you don't know what's going on there. And then once when I actually visited her there, she warned me, please, Ruthie, at that time um, it was the disengagement, and I had opposed it, and she said to me, whatever you do, please do not get up and attack 
Ariel Sharon. You don't understand. Here in Israel, we have a debate going on. But out there, they see him as a bloodthirsty murderer. And you just don't understand the level of anti-Semitism, not as a former American and not as an Israeli. So I beg of you, please don't do it. And I totally trust Fiamma, and so I didn't do it. Those are the only moments I've ever heard her speak with some kind of despair. I assume that that is why she decided she just had to write a book that is both a love letter to Israel and an appeal to Europe. Of course, it was in Italian, so first it was to Italians. An appeal to them to understand that they really um, have to wake up to who their real friends and allies are, not just uh, because Israel is a democracy in the Middle East, but because of what Fiamma calls in her book uh, the machine of vitality that so many Europeans had lost because of what Natan was explaining and Fiamma herself saying, um, I even have a quote about that, um, saying that they had abandoned all of their roots, all their history. Um, this isn't only the Jews, but certainly the Jews as well. She says, what in my eyes remains difficult to understand today, and for which I would like to make amends, is our contempt toward the generation of our parents, who, cursed by the Second World War, got back on their feet to rebuild democracy as well as a future that put human rights in all of its various cues first. But, she says, our generation, the self-declared ideological orphans, who threw out the teachings and customs of our elders, were capable of disapproval as no one before had ever been, and there is no weapon more powerful and capable of extortion than scorn. Well, what Fiamma does in this book is something very extraordinary, and I'm saying that as a writer and as an editor. Why does somebody articulate an argument? Why would somebody need to write a book about the case for Israel? Well, there are two possibilities. One, which is often futile, but uh, it's sort of an uphill battle, and that is to persuade or educate either your enemies or their apologists. Now, you know, well, we've seen how, how well that works. The other reason is certainly easier but I think even more important, and that is to provide your friends and your allies and other people who may not know anything about uh, the world, to provide them with the tools to both to make the argument themselves, but also to understand that they're on the right side, to know that they're not alone. And as a matter of fact, walking in Rome with Fiamma, I would see people come up to her in droves, almost on the sly, to whisper in her ear, you saved my life. Thank you for what you're writing. Thank you for telling the truth. Because there really are more people out there, I think, than we know, who wish that they could come out in public and support Israel and America. But how could you do that if George Bush is the great Satan and Israel is the small Satan. So what Fiamma does in this book is she does both, which is really, really hard to do, to both persuade the other side and to provide your side with the tools. Um, it's especially hard to do when you're being so passionate as Fiamma is in this book. Um, it's, that's especially hard because passion often comes out as sappiness. You know, describing Israel as Fiamma does, the life here, the vitality. Uh, it's really hard to do that without sounding sappy, you know. Oh, everybody's just so wonderful here because she is, after all, describing heroism. But she does it in a very understated way at the same time as, as banging you over the head, not you, but the Europeans, over the head with why they should understand this and why Israel isn't just a Jewish state in the Middle East, and it's not just a democracy, but it represents all of them. 
Now, I was really, really happy the book was translated into English because I interviewed Fiamma when the book came out in Italian. And Fiamma described it and she told her story and I couldn't read it because it was in Italian. Um, now, you may think that when you know somebody really well and you spend as many hours as I have with Fiamma in her house, in my house, at cafes, talking about the world and everything else, you might think that there, there would be no surprises in a book like this, since I know Fiamma's views. But you'd be wrong. I was, in fact, extremely surprised um, by the interlacing of history, of uh, her, her youth as a communist, um, her descriptions of her friends, her descriptions even of Israel, and I live in Israel, I've lived in Israel even longer than Fiamma, and yet it was a surprise. Um, it, it's funny how Fiamma, she's talking about Israel, she's presenting Israel to Europe. But actually, the book is very much like Fiamma herself. Um, this kind of beacon in the middle of um, enemy territory, so to speak, both, and that's both literal and, literal and, um, and not so literal. Um, she w has been in war zones her whole life, literally, but figuratively, she's been in a battle zone um, in, in countries that are not friendly to what she has to say. Now, luckily, as Natan said, obviously more and more people in Italy are becoming open to her views uh, because they are uh, demonstrating, they did demonstrate in favor of um, Israel's operation in Gaza. And the fact is that Fiamma is a huge celebrity in Italy. A lot of Israelis don't know that. You walk behind Fiamma, she's got her bodyguards and her people coming up and asking her to sign their books. And that brings me to the last point. And that is that I'm sorry the book isn't translated into Hebrew. I think it should be sooner rather than later. You know, often when intellectuals, um, let's say, articulate the position of leaders and politicians, you know, and when we read those, those works, we say, oh, I wish he, you know, often we would read about Bush and we'd say, oh, I wish Bush would read that, but I wish Bush knew that that's what he was up to. Well, when Fiamma describes Israel, that's sort of the way I feel. You know, I wish Israelis knew that what they're up to here is not just, it's not just that after a suicide bombing they clean up, clean up the cafe and go back there the next day and talk about sex. It's not just that they will leave their jobs, as Fiamma describes, and go off to war and, uh, and do it with, with uh, hmm, I would say, not even with any complaint, which is funny in a country full of people who kvetch all day long. And <laughs> it's, not, it's not just that Israelis do it, but I think it's important for Israelis to read about themselves doing it. I think they need to read about what it is. They'll say to themselves, oh yeah, that's right. That's why I'm here. That's why I was born here. That's who I am. I'm a superior person in so many ways. And um, so I think really, sooner than later, this book has to be translated into Hebrew. Dory, there's a, uh, here's a job for you to, <laughs> to, to tackle. Um, so now I'd just like to hand the floor over to my very dear friend, Fiamma Nierenstein. Thank you. Well, um, this book, is about a relationship. It is about the relationship between me as an Italian woman, an Italian journalist, an Italian professional, an Italian mother, uh, an Italian patriot that not uh, for a matter of, as a matter of chance is today a member of the parliament because I believe in my country and as a and you Israeli, it's a relationship, Israel, that is my heart and my soul, and I wouldn't say my second country, I would say my country, uh, uh, just uh, 
two parts of my life that are so closely intertwined and not as a matter of chance. Uh, actually, I think it's not a matter of chance that Italy today is the state that most understand Israel. I was a few days ago in Strasbourg and they were discuss, dis, dis, discussing the Gaza war, the war against uh, Hamas. And I've heard one after the other the Swedish, the French, the German, the, not the German were a little better, the, 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 the Greek, the Turkish that spoke one after the other, all of them spoke, five members, they, they all spoke, the Greeks, they all spoke, and uh, the, the, the people from Holland and wherever else, where they were making when they got up and spoke so, and took the floor incredible uh, narrative. Uh, uh, I'm against narrative. <laughs> uh, uh, mistakes about what was going on in Gaza. They even didn't know what really went on. I took it with me because I thought I would have some time to read to you something, but most of them were really uh, using uh, uh, what I call sick words, ill words. Uh, genocide and uh, and slaughters and uh, uh, and uh, disproportionate uh, reaction and uh, you know the, the the slaughters of civilians and no one was facing the the real philosophical theoretical basical problems that this war has been putting just in the hands of the world to be discussed because all the world is in front of an attack by forces that use civilians as human shields and aim to civilians as the aim that they have to kill women and children, never mind, while, uh, while uh, Israel since uh, a long, long time, because since the very beginning has been subjected to terrorist attacks, uh, is dealing with the problems of uh, civilians uh, carefully and uh, and uh, with a lot of uh, uh, discussion and studies and uh, different uh, behaviors and uh, and also uh, with a lot of uh, severity whenever there is the suspicion that things have not been done uh, properly well the approach to this problem was completely irrational and if one wonders why, irrational, that's the real word. So the, the, what, what I would say as a statement is that the world is dealing with the Israeli question as irrationally as it has been dealing all over the century with the Jewish problem. No more, no, irrationality is the basis uh, uh, of, of the way it think about it. It's not able to think about it. Irrationality is the main basis. And even uh, we were discussing a couple of nights ago with my friend Andrea Levine and the group of camera, how come that since such a long time we try to explain what's going on over here? And they do not know and they do not understand. When I say they, I'm speaking about the worst and word. How come? that they do not know that the Jewish have a basic right to be here. That the part of, it, there are so very simple things. It, it, when there was the partition, the number of Arabs that were in the area that, that, that was partitioned to the Arabs were 100,000. And we were more over there. There are things that are so very simple to know. And, and also that the, all of this enormous area has always been attacking Israel, while Israel has always been handing, uh, 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 um, trying uh, to lend uh, to the, its hand for peace whenever and wherever, and everybody can read it in the history books and they have, the, have a lot of records about it. Uh, well, uh, things are clear, dates are there, names are there, uh, everything is, has been described as it, should, as it should have been. There are no mistakes in the, in the history books, even if the narrative. But the narrative of the Palestinians and of the Arab world has been so enormously stronger 
than ours. We are so defeated in this, uh, even if, as I was saying before, there is somebody now that has been observing uh, the things, has, has got also a political turn, because this is very important, as Italy had. Now, I'm not giving a, a general judgment of my government. This is not the place and the time. But certainly, what is important to say is that when you have a political turn and the knowledge is there and you put together the two things and the strength in pushing the, the truth and the reality is stronger, then you can get to something. And this is why all the uh, Italian delegation at Strasbourg, to close this circle, uh, uh, was com completely disagreed with all of the... Uh, defamation that was taking place over there and had a completely different uh, had a completely different position position I wanted to say this because uh, I'm proud of it and I think it's also good news and sometimes we need good news now I was saying that uh, the, the, the second point is this relationship between you and me and and also me and you because I'm inside myself so small si parva licet as they say but this is what it is and uh, Ruti really got the point if you knew what you are you don't know what you are you are the people that when a when a boy uh, uh, that works as a waiter has an earring and plays a guitar in the cafe cafit uh, sees somebody coming in with a with a um, bag full of uh, TNT stops him and asks him what, what is there in and, he, and, the, and the guy the Arab guy says it's mine and the boy still standing in front of him says I didn't ask uh, whose is this I asked what have you got there inside and then takes the TNT bag goes out with that take all the the way the the cafe until the end put it down, and then I ask him, why did you do that? Weren't you afraid to die? And he said, no, ma, and of course I was afraid to die, but I am one, and here there were 50 people sitting in the coffee shop. This has been happening to me plenty of times, when I followed the soldiers in Lebanon, and the soldiers were explaining me how they were uh, uh, standing nearby their friends, their wounded friends, even if the helicopter already came to pick them up and they didn't want to go with the helicopter. How they could get in the dark into Lebanon, walking 10 meters one from the other, knowing that they could be dead in, in, in two minutes and they do that. Do you think that in the world there are many people that can do that? There are not. Do you think that there are many people in the world that like Vera, me, and Ruti and Dida and my sister Simona would have go and sit the day after the explosion of a bomb in the same place uh, just in front and sit and drink their coffee and, and chat about uh, family and love and, and children? Do you think that there are many people that do not hate going to, to the human rights, like the Israeli? Because even Yvette Lieberman doesn't hate. Don't come and tell me that he's a racist. He puts a problem there. That is a problem. And maybe, I don't know him inside, even if I interview him a couple of times. But he has never, I never heard the word of him, of his, against the Arabs, like saying <laughs> the Arabs are dirty, the Arabs are ignorant, the Arabs are the Arabs. I never, I never heard the uh, defamation word about the Arabs. I heard a lot of criticism. Well, look, in Italy, people, because there is the problem of the immigration, go and, and put, put on fire an Indian guy just uh, four days, uh, five days ago. And this happens all the time. The, when, the, when racism is racism in Europe, in Israel, well, there can be a small group of racists, uh, but there is no racism, there is not in the schools, there is not in the chats of the people sitting in the restaurant. I never heard a racist, uh, a, a racist word. And if, uh, let's say, a, a teacher dares saying something in a school, I am sure there will be immediately an investigation and get something against the Arabs, I mean. And he would be kicked out from the school. I mean, uh, uh, 
even on this side, uh, on the way the Israeli think and the Israeli work and the Israeli help each other and the Israeli are, to are together in the moment of need, even if, if uh, of course, they are all human beings, so they can be selfish, they can be business loggers, uh, there are many. They, 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 they can be corrupted, but look, believe me, when you look at Israel as it is, you should be much prouder of yourself than you are today, and mostly you should say to the world, look, Iran is not there only for us. The, the Hamas and the Hezbollah are not there only for us, they are there for you too. They threat uh, Rome and the Vatican, as they have been doing there so many times, exactly as they, as they, as they uh, threat you. And uh, you should start, and you have proof of that, the, the, the tube in London exploded, and the tube in, uh, in Spain exploded and uh, the, the attempts of attacks and the, and the, and the um, groups of uh, terrorists that are found continuously in all over in Europe uh, and the road that they took from Germany through Italy to, toward Iran, Iraq, uh, well, this has been really something, you know, and uh, we, still have a, we, we still have a lot of terrorists down there. And, uh, they are there for Israel as they are there for us. The ideology, the jihadism, it's just, it's just the same. Uh, there are things that you should be much more proud of, like for instance, there are so very many, I would say only one thing uh, more, and then I go to my conclusions. Uh, uh, in the 50s, the number of the immigrants in, uh, in Israel was the 50% of the population. In Europe, we have a problem with, with immigration. Don't know how, how to integrate all of these people coming. Also because there is an ideology of hate, and this is another problem, and it's mostly a security problem. But actually, we also have a real problem about immigration. Only Israel, and maybe in some periods, the United States have known what it is, what is it about. Now, uh, why don't you learn something from them? Why don't we ask them how they integrated uh, the, the Iranian, the Iraqis, the, the Germans and the Russians? The, why, why don't we go there and ask them, how did you teach them speaking their, your language? How, how did you, we don't have any real curiosity about this country that is facing, is facing the non-condition, uh, um, non, non non-unbalanced, non the, non uh, the, the war when it's uh, uh, the, the, this new uh, the, the dispro not disproportionate uh, 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 no 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 asymmetric the non symmet the non symmetric war so on one side uh, the, the the army or the police and on the other side somebody that is using completely different means that break any uh, any Geneva convention or any other uh, convention uh, so show yourself as you are. Change the way you talk about yourself. You have to do it that very quickly. And I will tell you why. Uh, the reason why is that there is a threat to Israel as there has never been before. I think, but in maybe 1948. Um, and, this, uh, and this threat, of course, comes from uh, Iran and, and its allies. And nobody is ready to believe it. Nobody believes it. Nobody wants to hear about it. Mostly when you say that this threat is the same. I mean that Israel is under the same threat as as all the Western world. Nobody, nobody, nobody in Europe will believe to this. Not even the Italians that are much more ready to understand what Israel is going through. But still, it is a problem of Israel. The genocidal attitude that is new, is new, is, is just falling on, a, a, on, on an ancient, uh, almost a sleeping anti-Semitism that is there. And then you, you have these, uh, you know, these things that tells you from the back, already with a lot of uh, very important books and articles that are not only uh, on uh, side press, but also on the New York Times, on the or, or on the 
uh, <coughs> review of books and wherever you find them, I mean books, uh, in very important books, uh, that tells you why should Israel be there after all? Why? There is no, no real reason uh, why. And it starts, being, you know, there has been a decay, a dec decadence of the public discourse in the, uh, 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 all over the world. Ca could you imagine somebody like Ahmadinejad taking the floor in the, in the United Nations and saying uh, uh, that uh, Israel is like a, a broken uh, uh, tree that, has, that will uh, very soon disappear? Could you imagine that a few years ago, even Arafat was better in the United <laughs> Nations. Tried to, yeah, yeah, Arafat didn't use this kind of expressions. He tried to enter the anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist, and tried to present the case of the Palestinians as third world poor people. That was the way Arafat did. No, Ahmadinejad is not doing this anymore. Ahmadinejad is going there and saying things that we never heard before. We have never heard that before. And, it's, and then he appears on the Time magazine and on the CNN and the everywhere. And, that, and people start thinking that why is the, the legitimation of Israel is going down? The legitimation of Ahmadinejad is climbing because of the media attention, because of the invica invitation at the university, because the UN floor, and, uh, and whatsoever. So we have a decline of the public discourse that let the ignorant and the, and, the, and the stupid have the floor as never before. This is the situation. Now, last point. Please, quick, you have to change your, your public discourse, you have to change the way you present yourself to the world, and we have to do the same with you. Why I'm saying that? Because you're soon going to have a right-wing government. That's for sure. Because even if it will be a, if it will be a, a, a coalition government, still the majority will be right-wing. Well, you don't know what expects you from the side of the European. The newspaper are already full of this. That they all say Israel doesn't want to make peace. This is the way that they understand. That Israel is is electing a right wing racist because there will be also Yvette Lieberman and uh, and uh, disastrous because you remember what Netanyahu did you know because they considered that it was Netanyahu that broke at that time the, the peace process so please be ready Israel will be considered a war uh, state much more than it is today things are going to worst worsen while uh, the international situation is going to be more and more serious. That, that's my message. We have, we, have to be, uh, we have to be ready for a new struggle, a, a different... Uh, and uh, so bad times are coming for the understanding for the intellectual side of the struggle for and uh, we have to be prepared we have to be prepared for that uh, and I promise you that it will be worth nothing if if we keep going in Europe and in the United States if the Israeli don't do something about it uh, with all the due respect and I finish really finish with that in Strasbourg the one that was defending the case of Israel in front of all of this uh, hate and uh, ashmatza uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, Ran Cohen, very sympathetic, nice guy from Meretz, yes? He spent all the time at his disposal to ensure the people there that he has been a fighter for the peace all of his life. And, do, and, and saying this, which was very nice and I appreciate it, but do you think that he convinced the, the, the public there that, uh, that uh, Israel, uh, that, that, that the military leaders in Israel and also the politicians are not war criminals? No, he did not. He did not. And this is not the way to apologize, to say every, all the time, maybe, yes, we know we made some mistake and... Uh, but not all of them, but some we did. And anyhow, I've been fighting for peace all my life long. 
this is not the case. You have to say, we are a, a, a model case study for democracies in the world. And mostly today, because when Iran will have reached the atomic bomb, then Israel is us. Israel will be us much more than it is today. about as someone who's observed Israel's self-understanding for many years. You've given us today a shot in the arm, you give us some encouragement, ranging somewhere between a good psychologist and a, and a cousin or a friend, but give us your sense of what has happened to Israel in the last, let's say, 16 or 17 years that it can't, in a way, stand up for itself, that it can't make its own case. What do you think is going on in the collective psych or psychopathology of Israel that makes it the way it is, and then how might it, from your standpoint, get out of, of the hole that it's in? Shall we take some, some questions? Everybody say your name to everybody. No? Yeah. Okay. Okay, no worries. Uh, Rafi Israeli, and uh, Fiamma, I would like to ask you about the new mayor of Rome, Alemani. I, I, Alemano. I heard some uh, statements that he made that are very pro-Jewish, pro-Israel and so on. Can you tell us a little bit about the context? What place that he have in uh, Italian politics? What is his impact? How likely is he to uh, influence uh, future politics in Italy? Thank you. This one works? No, it doesn't work. It doesn't matter. I'm loud enough. Alright, so let's make I'm loud enough. Fiamma. Fiamma. We're all looking forward to reading the book. Those of us that can't couldn't read Italian. And your passion comes through marvelously. We we really love to hear it. like to hear more of you. Fiamma, I'd like to know what you said about Israel we're all aware of. I'd like you to also make a few comments, and I think that part of the problem comes from Israel, but what's happened to Jewish leadership in Europe and in the Western world, and could there be, could they make a difference if they weren't what they are? If we in Israel ever had a leader that was brave enough to say that we can't go for a two-state solution, we've tried and it's failed because there's nobody to talk to, and anyone who has even a basic understanding of Islam knows that it also won't solve the problem. What do you think the reaction would be to that in specifically Italy, but also Europe, if you want to present? Um, I also have a question for Fiamma, if I may, because I've got the mic, so I get to. <laughs> the question is, how do you explain the discrepancy between the new leadership in Europe, um, for example, Angela Merkel, the, the trend Berlusconi, that trend, versus 
the population of Europe. What's going on there? Deplorable, as you pointed out, there's a deplorable ignorance about uh, basic history in the uh, in Europe among the journalists, generally, and uh, not yourself, and among uh, even among uh, among politicians, and even among some university people. Now, how do you explain this ignorance? I mean, we're talking about ignorance about Jewish history. The history of Jews in Europe, the history of there Jews so in Europe. so many dead in Gaza. And he said, well, you know, the Israeli army is not the same. Of, uh, there, were, there are no more the same people that used to be careful because of the problem of the civilians. Now, most of all the people that go to fight are Ethiopians and, and Russians. <laughs> I was, you know, he's a very outstanding, and I, I wanted to laugh just like you. I, <laughs> And, uh, and so it's not as much as ignorance as real fantasies going around. That, then, uh, and here, and here, I want to to go what Dan said. Um, look, Dan, you ask what happened to Israel, and my answer is not much. If you go with the army on the border, and if you go uh, with them, and you, you talk to these boys. You won't find a great difference from what they were 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. They all want to defend the country. They see no other thing that they could do but that. And, and uh, you know, we were together many times on, uh, on, on the field, oh, my colleague. But uh, when, you, when you speak to the soldiers, uh, you don't find all of this moral decay that is usually described on the Israeli papers just like the children are the same. They are proud, they are strong, they are natural in their behavior. They want to fight, they want to be in combat unit, and uh, they don't want to kill, but if they have to, they will kill, and uh, they will save their friends uh, whenever they can. And they they are not so different then. Would you believe me at the end? I mean, believe a journalist that has been looking with the eyes and not with the eyes of the ideology. What is different, what is different is the, uh, the political, uh, the political uh, group. Well, you know, politicians for the good and for the bad are always different. Sometimes they are more advanced, sometimes they are uh, backward. Uh, in Italy, for instance, uh, we had this demonstration that somebody was quoting in front of the parliament. All the politicians came uh, from Fini 
to the to to the PD, the ex communist party, they were all fought to climb on the floor and say their good word for Israel. Well, still, in Italy, we had the demonstration of people going around and say, Hamas, Hamas, just to the gas. This happened also in Italy. Eh? It's not that it didn't happen at all. It's only that the political, Kilon, at this time of, the, of, the, of history, has a good position on, on, on foreign policy. They, they understand for a lot of reasons that now would be difficult to, to explain shortly. So I would ask you, uh, uh, of course, you know, youngsters nowadays, uh, when they go home, eh, they don't sing around the Finjan, and uh, they they go to the to the disco and they and they drink uh, some whiskey. And good, good for us that our children are normal. They and they have sex and they have uh, friends. Uh, who cares? I mean, I'm, I'm delighted that they make their happy life. And uh, this doesn't mean that they have changed morally here, because here, when when they when they have to know that they have to defend uh, uh, their family and that they have to love their country, you don't know how different you are. This morning uh, there was a long, long discu discussion on the radio on why the Kalaniot did not yet <laughs> flower, uh, did not yet flower on Tuvishvat. It was really a theoretical problem that everybody started discussing. And there were different opinions, and, <laughs> and they were arguing with each other. Oh, it's delightful, you know. It's delightful. It, it's, uh, it's, I, I have a cousin uh, whose daughter is in India, and whenever she calls, the first thing that she asks is, how is the Kineret? <laughs> the Kineret? <laughs> All right. What's happening with the Kineret? And, uh, uh, well, listen, it's not a case study. Everybody asks it here. Don't, don't you ask it every day? How is the Kineret? So, then, please, try to see this. I'm not joking. I'm very serious now. Try to see your situation and your culture. And, you know, it's marvelous to look at the Israeli television, and uh, you consider it uh, uh, that today it is at a very low level. Please try to look at the uh, European televisions. <laughs> try to listen to the to the European radios, to, and, and try then to see your programs. I mean, uh, this is still the country that built uh, the Philharmonic Orchestra and the and the University of Jerusalem before the state was built. And this is still, and in, in, in the book there is a part about it, it this is still in the DNA of, uh, of the country. And uh, this is also something that you have to retrace. You yourself have to see yourself in a different way. If you won't do that, nothing will, nothing will uh, succeed. This is, this is what I think. Um, the Jewish leadership. The Jewish leadership... Uh, is like anywhere, uh, like anywhere in the diaspora, trying uh, uh, to defend Israel, uh, but also being very worried where there, when there is a strong criticism uh, toward Israel, and, uh, and sometimes uh, looking like a tough Jew and being a tough Jew uh, doesn't uh, meet the approval of, of all of my friends, <laughs> so, to, so to say. But uh, you are right. Easy. It's it's true. Well, if our Jewish leadership would be a more proud Jewish leadership, and then again I go to if the Israeli were more proud, the Jewish leadership would be yeah. more proud too. So that, that that is also something very important about Alemanno. Alemanno is a direct uh, emanation of a Fini in this field. The Fini came to to Yad Vashem, put a kip on his head, bound, uh, bent down. On, on, uh, bent down on his knees and asked forgiveness, and uh, he was sincere, and he has demonstrated it for a long, long time. And Aleman is going on his step. Uh, the, the clever part of the party has gone on his step. And then you have to understand one more thing, that that party that used to be the neo-fascist party in the 60s and in the 70s, uh, at a certain point met Berlusconi. That, that uh, 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 it, it, 
has never been a fascist in any way. Uh, uh, it can be sympathetic, not sympathetic to anybody here, but it has never been a fascist in any way. He's a he's a liberal a capitalist with a with a view of the world that is a secular. It's a secular view without uh, ideologies that are connected to any to any autocratic uh, regime. Absolutely. So what happens that because the two had to, to melt and to become one only party, they got together and also the, the right moved to the left a little bit. And having Feeney as a real leader that took them out and said that the, the contemporary, he said something terrible for his, par his party because he said the contemporary culture uh, is an anti-fascist anti culture, is the anti-fascist culture. So he delegitimized completely the past and entered with two legs into, jumped with both his feet into the modernity. And uh, this is what it is uh, um, today. Why is Europe divided? Well, uh, let's take an example. Uh, uh, um, the French, when uh, the Germans that occupied French asked them to put all the uh, Jewish children on a train and send them away alone toward the, the concentration camps, they did it. They did it. Uh, the Italians, even if they had Russian laws, were never so anti-Semitic as the French. There is a long, long story and so the French, the French have, have have a big Jewish community, uh, have a much bigger Muslim community today. So this explains many things. Um, and uh, just like uh, the French, there are the Belgians, where the most uh, the most popular name is Muhammad already. Do you know that? I mean, uh, the, the, the first name. And then uh, the, the 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 countries like Norway, like these are countries where the the Muslim problem is very very strong, and uh, the, 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 it has an influence, of course, on this country. Italy is a country that doesn't yet have such a strong Muslim problem, and Germany is a country that has moral pre principle because uh, they did the only best. And they, <laughs> so, no, this is not what I wanted to say. But probably, the, yeah, but probably there is also something like that. Probably they, they think they know how to deal with problems. They think they know how to deal with problems. And anyhow, they still have a sense of responsibility toward Israel. This is what I wanted to say. Echo. Still they have this. So they keep certain uh, restraint. Look, if you read... Uh, the, the transcript of, of that uh, meeting, you will see that uh, Italy, Germany, and the Canadian uh, observer were, a, and one of the British, because the other one was really the worst of all, but one of the British, those were, were good. All the rest were, were doing analysis that a two years old uh, child uh, would, uh, would say, what is this? This is what are you talking about? This is irrational. This uh, doesn't have any truth in it. It's uh, it's ridiculous. Uh, uh, yeah, and it's not that if when when you explain that then you got it. No, when you explain, uh, it depends very much, as I said uh, at, at the beginning, on the not on the rationality of what you say, but on the rationality of the one who hears, the one who sits in front of you. So if there is an irrational element, uh, he will get, he will turn it, he will squeeze it, he will enlarge it his own way. And uh, since, as I said before, the, the public discourse is declining awfully, it's really declining and there are so many examples of it, it's really a metaphor. So there is a chapter about the declining, but now it's much more than then. It's, it's changing day after day. So we cannot count on it. We cannot count on truth. Truth 
truth will not uh, prove itself, even if we have to pursue it uh, because uh, of our moral position. But uh, this would not, uh, this will not uh, influence. Us. We have to think how to make it and to make a radical change. <laughs>